Welcome to American Government, Spring 2021. Um, I am Professor Pulvordi. I've always loved the rather um, anapestic trimeter of that, if you ever learned how to scan poetry in English in high school or grade school. Um, Professor Pulvordi, that's how you pronounce that uh, apparently unspellable and unpronounceable agglomeration of letters that constitutes my name. And uh, what I want to do in today's lecture is, uh, and there are no notes for this lecture, by the way, it's um, uh, the notes will begin on Monday, February 15th. And um, and as I mentioned in my emails, and uh, let me just reinforce that part of your grade in this class is attendance, and attendance means watching these fascinating lectures um, that will keep you on the edge of your seat. Um, and by the way, uh, you know, uh, since these are recorded, you can technically re-attend them or attend them more than once, which is actually, if you don't understand something, go back and play it again or listen to it again. Uh, and remember, human beings have an infinite capacity for um, uh, self-punishment. So, But just in case, don't forget that these are recordings and you can watch them again if you don't understand them. Invite your friends over. Share them with your parents or your pets. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do today is just, in addition to introducing myself, which you've already probably gotten enough of, um, uh, talk a little bit about what this course is about, what I try to do. I'll go over the syllabus a bit and try to give you some examples of uh, PRQs, the preparation and review questions, which are the key to mastery of the material in this course. And um, I'll, uh, again, as I mentioned, um, uh, to take attendance, or to rather to signify attendance, all you have to do is after each lecture, which will be posted, as I've mentioned in my emails, either in the evening or the early morning of Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of each week. The original uh, in-person class was a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday class. But basically you have, as I mentioned, your discretion to watch these at your convenience over the course of a day or two days for that matter. By 12 o'clock on the next class day, which of course is if Monday, we're talking about Wednesday. If it's Wednesday, we're talking about Friday. If it's Friday, we're talking about Monday. Just had to make that clear. Uh, by noon, you have to signify to me by email that you watch the class. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the honor system and the honor code. Uh, I've been a student for 300 years and a professor at six different colleges and universities. And, um, and it's an important fact to remember that students are human beings for the most part, and um, and uh, and I might as well talk about honor yeah, and the honor code right now. Uh, Congress has an honor code, not every college and university does, and a significant portion of your work or uh, exam examinations at Congress are taken under the honor code. You all signed that when you became um, a part of the college as, as a freshman during orientation. And um, you know, the uh, social scientists estimate that um, between 10% and 20% of all student populations cheat. And it's interestingly enough, honor codes, um, and some with very robust. I was a graduate student at UVA, which at that time, in the early 1700s, uh, had a very robust honor code. The only sanction of which, by the way, was expulsion. And uh, and it seemed to work pretty well, but we it's hard to know that. So uh, when I give you your exams or uh, or trusting to you that you have signified honestly that you've attended the lecture i am in fact trusting to your honor and your honesty if you look at the syllabus um i try to explain the principle of honor and uh, since one of my fields is uh, political philosophy and since i'm a believer in god and i'm a orthodox jew an observant jew um just to make sure i mean not everyone believes in god and not everyone who believes in god thinks that cheating is a moral offense, um, and um, and as I explain in my comments on honor on the syllabus, if you're secular and don't believe in God, the reason is called honor. And Aristotle explains this in his great treatise, uh, secular treatise on human morality, the Nicomachean Ethics, that what is honorable makes you se seem noble or elevated as human being, and then the opposite of of, on, of noble, which means uplifted or beautiful, is base. And, and generally speaking, I, I think it's probably true that most human beings know when they are debasing themselves by not choosing the high road. 
And if you're a religious person and believe in the Ten Commandments, cheating is technically a, st a, a combination of stealing and lying, which is a, two of the big ones. So I, 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 that's my little sermon about turning in honest work. So, um, uh, but at any rate, um, again, uh, I'll be posting these lectures. As, and as I mentioned, there are no notes for today, but there will be beginning on Monday. And I also passed out the daily schedule of PRQs and uh, have just passed out the actual sets of preparation and review questions for the uh, first couple of sections of the syllabus, the first couple of weeks of class, and for your first exam on um, Monday, March 8th. As I mentioned, uh, uh, let me explain the invention of PRQs. About 10 years ago, I realized it took me a while. I guess after having been a student and after teaching, as I mentioned, at six universities and colleges and t teaching thousands of students, that um, probably most college students don't prepare for class. One of my favorite moments when I first came to Converse in 1986, um, and I was teaching Congress, uh, and I had asked some question about the assigned reading early on in the semester, and some uh, charming young student um, 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 she, she was her nickname, Sharon. I love the South. Um, I'm from Illinois originally, and people ask me in, in the North all the time, how do you like living in the South? And I say, I love living in a part of the country where people wait uh, until their back is turned to, to you before they start talking about you. Bless your heart. One of my favorite phrases is to say, bless your heart, as they say down here, but not the way they mean it down here, because if you're raised here, you know what bless your heart means. It means, you know, bless your heart that you stopped beating your alcoholic mother who deserved it anyway. But anyway, so I digress. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I asked a question about the reading in that class, and she, she said, well, wow, Professor Pavoti, uh, what's the point of uh, reading material beforehand? Uh, we come to class and find out what's important, and then we go back and read. Well, maybe that is the governing philosophy of most college students, bless their hearts. Um, uh, but at any rate, uh, technically, it's good for you as a student to prepare for class, and it's good for you to go to class and take notes, very difficult. A multi, too multitasking, and I'll ex explain how my notes work. And uh, then it's good for you to review <laughs> after class. Um, I don't know how many of us ever um, uh, attain that that ideal of being a good student. I mean, I'm still working on it at the age of 68. But at any rate, um, so uh, I experimented with different ways of using these uh, questions in class. And what I finally settled on in the last several years is to pass them out. And then the preparation part is, is for you to go through and use them to guide in your preparatory reading for class. And the presumption, by the way, is that you won't be able to answer all of them or even fully. Um, I get asked all the time, what's most important in this class? The lectures or the readings, they are both equally important. And the questions to be answered fully require you not only to read the materials, again, in preparatory fashion, um, and uh, but then also to attend class. And let me just explain my note system. I pass, I don't like PowerPoint. I, I mentioned that in the email and I explained why I think it contributes to short attention span and to a kind of a superficiality. But I do like students because I wander off the point all the time. I do like students to have a, 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 an overall view of the structure and lecture of my notes. I think that helps uh, grasp a sense of the whole in the direction of my comments. So as I said, note taking is really difficult. I mean, when you think about it, you have to combine several different skills. I mean, you have to listen, you have to digest and summarize, you have to write down and decide what's important. Uh, and and in in person classes, by the way, I actually don't permit any electronic devices, laptops, computers, uh, iPads or pods, and, and especially telephones. I make students turn off their telephones and put them away. Uh, that's a whole different issue, and in an online class, it doesn't matter. So uh, you have to use electronic devices, obviously. Um, unless you invited me to a sleepover in your room in which I bring my pajamas and sleeping bags and we just talk about Federalist 10 all night. Um, um, that's probably not what you're paying your uh, $2,000 annual tuition at Converse College for. At any rate... Um, uh, so uh, I pass out my notes beforehand, and that will start with Monday's lecture, the February 15th, and uh, in outline form, in two versions, PDF 
and and Word. I'll just tell you, I hate Word as a word processing program. Ever since I bought my first PC, that's personal computer, in 1986, that's 1986. I've loved Word Perfect, which I think is a far superior program. So I do all my work in Word Perfect. I convert it to Word. Sometimes the formatting is not all good, so I also send it out in PDF form. But um, the point about the Word form is for you, it, it, you can download it, and then I typically double space uh, my lecture notes so you can write in between them. And that's uh, what I'm trying to do is encourage you to take notes and follow my lecture. And also at the same time, write your own notes. Now, in a perfect world, that means after class, you would then type up your notes using my uh, 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 Word version as a template. And, and all the studies show that if you review and go over what you've just done in class immediately, it, it increases retention amazingly. So, um, and then, uh, uh, I've decided that after many years of experimenting, then the best way to employ these questions is to use them as exam questions. Now you'll notice there are a lot of questions, hundreds of them over the course of this semester. And I can't believe it that, that after uh, um, uh, watching thousands of students over the years, uh, or having been a student that, gosh, I know I'm about to say something and will shock you to pieces, that students, hmm, uh, wait until the last minute to do things. And that activity, which is part of student consciousness, is often called cramming. Well, there are so many questions here that if you wait to do that, if you don't do these and keep up with them, um, remember, I only give you an hour to take the exam. I'll pick 15 of these questions for your hour exam. And again, um, as I said, the default setting for your exam on the dates listed on the schedule is from 12 to 1, noon, an hour. And again, if you can't make that, I'll, we'll arrange another hour period, but I'll pass the exam out to you and, and give you an hour and have you pass it back. Um, so if you wait to the night before or the day before, start reviewing these things, there's just too much. Uh, so you have to keep up. So preparation, review, and exam questions, that's what these are. Uh, I, I'll give you a couple of examples, especially, by the way, when you get your biggest glut of questions, which is on the Constitution in a couple of weeks, I make you read the Constitution and um, and and review it very intensely. But um, just to give you a hint um, on, on the uh, questions that I passed out that we'll be covering in the next couple of weeks, on the Declaration of Independence, if you turn and look at those questions, um, um, you will see that there are 15 uh, different questions and I'll be talking about these over the course of three lectures on February 17th, 19th, and 22nd. And these 15 questions are primarily geared to the getting you to read very attentively uh, the text of the Declaration. And you'll see the same with the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, all the great documents that we're studying, the original documents of American political history. But also, the, the, this, the readings in this course um, are mostly from the Nichols Reader, um, by the way, Mary Nichols was my uh, great professor in graduate school. And David was her husband and one of my good friends. So I, I know, uh, I don't, I didn't know Professor James Wilson was a great political scientist. But he has his the his textbook that I use in this class, the brief edition. Brief edition, by the way, is uh, is I think the best available. The least ideological, and most college textbooks are terribly written. And the presumption is that most college students read it at eighth grade level. So I like the Wilson text because it's literate well-written and non-partisan and not ideological. Let me just say this right now. Uh, I, for the most part, and I'm a human being, uh, I'm, there are people who think that I may be, uh, possess a whiff of other species, and I'll just, I'll just do my magic uh, powers for you right now. I can take off my thumb. Are you watching? Here it comes. Ooh, I love to do this to five-year-olds because their perceptual apparatus is developed enough to notice anomaly. You go, here, Billy, look at this. And you go, and he goes, ah, ah, ah. and the other thing I can do, even though I'm a cat person, and I think I used to be a cat in another lifetime, is I can bark realistically like a dog. Here it comes. Bark, 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 bark. I tell people that my mother was a collie. Um, but that's just to br brush up my family background. So, all right, all right, all right. So, um, uh, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, um, oh, I was talking about um, 
preparation and doing things on time. Well, whatever I was talking about. Um, and, oh, uh, um, so um, uh, let's go back to the PRQs for the Declaration, which are on the second page of the massive amounts of PRQs I sent to you. Um, so there are 15 questions, which primarily get you to read. Oh, not I don't know what it's going to say. Um, part of what college is, is to teach you how to read. And, and uh, most of you have grown up with iPhones now, having been born after the year 2000, and, and that unique set of human beings who have now developed as, as we over the age of 30 have not yet. You have now an evolutionary developed set of muscles for thumb texting, and I still like text, which is like using my elbows. But, um, but uh, reading is a difficult skill, as is note-taking, and part of college is teaching you how to read, and that's part of what I do with these PRQs is to I try to select questions that force you uh, to read the materials attentively and and to come away being able to answer the questions that a college level reader um, who worked hard at the material should be able to answer and that's my principle for all the preparation review questions in this course but I want to give you an example of what a good one is and I also sent out from the fall semester two A exams from the first exam that um, that will give you some example, uh, and uh, look at my statement of grades on the on the last page of the syllabus. Um, everybody wants an A, and, and there are even institutions like Princeton, for instance, where like 97% of the grades are A or A minus. The president of that institution says, "Well, it's because of all our students are excellent, maybe they are, but uh, but at any rate." Um, uh, look at my standards for grades. So those two exams that I sent out and included in the email that preceded this lecture uh, give examples of uh, excellent exams. Um, so, so uh, uh, and what that means is you can answer these questions on different levels and put different work in. If you answer them minimally, some of them are factual, and don't get me wrong, it, the answer is pretty straightforward. For instance, one question in the Constitution in a couple of weeks asks you what are the qualifications for office. It's pretty straightforward. You have to be 25 years old to be a member of the House of Representatives. You have to be a citizen for seven years and reside in the state. So that's a pretty straightforward answer. But most of these, you should conceive most of these uh, uh, questions as requiring a mini essay, a paragraph, as you'll see from my examples. And let me give you a quick example. So if you're looking at the PRQs on the Declaration of Independence, you'll see that there are 15 questions which I ask you to answer. And by the way, I group them according to what I perceive to be the internal structure of the Declaration of Independence, which, as you'll see, I think has five primary Roman numeral subject headings. So um, here's the uh, uh, 15th question, the last question on the Declaration. And, and again, um, these questions are designed so that you have to read the text, but you also have to, um, uh, um, you have to attend class because uh, after all, I've been studying this material all my life. I'm a professor. I have a PhD in this material. I'm uh, tedious and go on and on and on. I tell people that if I lost my job, I'd stand by an ex expressway ramp with a cardboard sign. I will go on and on for food, um, having been very fond of food most of my life. So at any rate, um, um, I want to give you an example because, for instance, this question, question number 15, which I'll read to you, um, only part of it is answerable from the text. And I don't expect you to go Googling the rest of the answer. I mean, that's actually not studying. That's asking the internet to do your work for you, strictly speaking. Um, and so I want to give you an example of what a full answer looks like and, uh, and how you have to use both the reading and the lecture. So if you're looking at question 15, which we'll come to in a couple of days, a couple of lectures, here's what it says. How many times is God mentioned or referred to in the Declaration? Is the Declaration a religious document? Is it a Christian document? Now, the last two parts of that question, whether the Declaration is an, a religious document, um, you could say, well, that's answered by the virtual fact that God is referred to. And how many times and where? Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Is it a Christian document? And the reason I deal with that question is not because I'm a Jew, but because it's a commonplace assertion about the Declaration and the other foundational aspects of American life that they are biblically founded and, and that the Declaration is a Christian document. Now, I, 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 I'll tip my hat right here, my hat, um, um, that uh, I, I don't agree with that position, not because I'm a Jew, 
uh, but because, as I and you'll see in my lectures, I, I, my lecture, I address this question. Uh, after all, if you say, well, the Declaration is a Christian document, how would you know it is? What d makes a document a Christian or a Jewish or a Muslim or a Hindu document? And so how wh what would be the minimally correct answer, which would be a C? And I grade the PRQs, all the PRQs in this course um, are 10 points each. So um, they roughly correspond to the percentages, you know, like 90% and above is an A, 80 and above and so forth. So what would be a minimal answer to the question, how many times and where is God mentioned? The answer is four. Now, if you just put four times, that would get you a five or a six out of ten, because it's the correct answer. But it's a minimal answer. You didn't put any work into it or show me that you understand why, and you could have just uh, heard that from, you could have downloaded that from the Internet. So uh, the next expansive answer to that question is, is it turns out that God is mentioned four times in the Declaration. In the first paragraph and the second verb, as you will come to understand it, the laws of nature and nature's God. And in the second paragraph, what I like to call the theoretical core, the core source of principles of the Declaration, uh, it says, they are. we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And in the last paragraph, the summary paragraph, uh, there are two references to God. We appeal to the supreme judge of the world and, and divine providence. So a fuller answer, a solid B answer of eight points out of ten would be to say there are four uh, mentions or references to God and what they are. That's a pretty good answer. It shows that you've done the work. But remember, there are two other parts of that question. Is it a Christian document and is it a religious document? And now here, you're just going to have, you'll see why you have to attend the lectures too, uh, because this is a very deep and profound question about this critical document in American life, and for that matter, the whole nature of American life. And, uh, and roughly, I'll just be uh, schematic here so you understand what a good answer would be like. Um, um, and this is what I'm going to argue and lay out my understanding of the Declaration. And now, this is my interpretation of the Declaration, but get, again, you'll see I, I keep pretty close to the text. And and since my field is political science, and in particular, political philosophy, I, I've, my five graduate fields at UVA were ancient and modern political philosophy, uh, American constitutional law and political thought, American national institutions, and of all things, international relations theory. Um, but um, you're going to see that the core ideas of American political life are taken from the immediately precedent generation of modern political philosophers. I'll talk all about this about in my lectures. So is the Declaration a religious document? Well, you can argue it is because God is mentioned. But you're going to see it's more complex than that. I'm going to argue it's not fundamentally a religious document. It doesn't require religious faith, although it is open to it. Now, that is, that's a complex assertion, which I'll talk about and explain in my um, uh, um, uh, lecture. The complicated question of, and this is often an emotionally charged uh, question for Americans, is is it a religious doc? Is it a Christian document? Now, as I said earlier, well, what I'm going to talk about in my lecture is how would you know? What's the standards? And I'll just be very brief here. Uh, I think a Christian document or a Jewish document requires three standards. It either has to refer to the holy, uh, sacred text of that tradition. It has to invoke the founder or the primary teacher of that tradition. And, and or its content and teaching has to uh, be identical to or be dependent upon the core teachings of that tradition. Uh, that's as far as I'll go for right now. My whole point here was to give you an example of what a full and reflective answer to one of the questions you'll be asked to answer. So I've answered it for you for that matter. So those are the PRQs and in the list of the PRQs that I sent out for the first couple of weeks, I include them all and and, um, and also the lectures to which they refer. So if you're wondering what questions are you responsible for at what date, this document answers it. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just roughly walk through my syllabus, give you a sense of what I do and don't do in the course, and uh, and its requirements. I've already talked to my name, Sam of Honor. The last couple of years I've been putting this uh, and, and, and by the way, note, um, uh, for consultation purposes, uh, 
uh, we, we can either Zoom or you, I even give you my cell phone number on the syllabus. You can contact me or by appointment. We can email. And, and by the way, just to reinforce, and as I mentioned several times, these preparation review questions are not assignments. You don't, you don't turn them into me. They are your exam questions. And again, they are the key to your preparation and reviewing the material in the course. Now, uh, look, I mean, some of these are very difficult. I, I demand a good deal of, of attention and sophisticated effort and understanding from my students. And if you can't answer a question, I am uh, I'm quite open to discussing it with you. Uh, although, generally speaking, um, um, I won't review your answers for you to tell you if you're doing well. But I will help you, uh, because that's my job, uh, if you really can't understand some point that I'm asking you in a question or some aspect of my lecture. So let me just say and, and reinforce this. Um, I am completely open to you, even though I'm 90 miles away from you. I live here in Charlotte. This is my beautiful office. Um, and, and in my little house here uh, in Charlotte. Um, but but um, we have plenty. So there are all kinds of ways you can consult with me, and I'm most happy to give you my time and effort to do that. So again, you don't have to turn these questions in, but if you have a question about any of them or need help with them, I will be happy to do that. I also recommend that students study in groups. Now this is delicate because um, I, I think group study, which I discovered only when I was a junior or senior in college and it made a remarkable difference in my academic performance and understanding. And I think the ideal uh, number for a study group is three or four. Any more, it's just too many, fewer than that. Yeah, then often you get um, parasites who are using other people and their study to make up for the fact they haven't studied. So you have to get four, three or four trusted people and form a small group. That's the best way to study. But again, it's a delicate thing. You can study together, but you can't turn in common answers. Your answers, not only in this class, but all classes, ultimately have to be based on your own. You can't download them from the internet. That's called plagiarism and cheating. Nor can you share answers. Um, and, and oftentimes in a course where so much material is, is like this is sent in on a regular basis, I'll know instantly if students are actually copying from each other something. They forget that, you know, that you see everything. They see it. It's like, you know, you always wonder when policemen walk into a 7-Eleven or something like that, they're always casing the joint. They always see things that we don't see because they see it differently. So it's, as I said, it's a sensitive thing. You can study together. But you can't turn your work in jointly. You have to actually answer these things in your own words and on your own terms. If you don't understand that, I'll be happy to comment or explain that more fully. But if you're looking at the syllabus, okay. So I told you how to pronounce my name, and and you can many people pronounce Polvorti again by going Polvorti. You don't have to do that. All right. Uh, I've added this the last couple of times. Horrible things never to say to an email or a professor. I hope my absence doesn't inconvenience you. I could give a damn about your absence. Your absence doesn't inconvenience me. That's a kind of an anticipatory and 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 attempt to be ingratiated. Thanking you in advance. I actually detest that statement. It is actually emotionally manipulative. It usually means somebody is asking you to do something, and they think that if they ask you nicely, you're more inclined to do it. Now, it always helps to ask people to do things nicely, but don't thank in advance. That's actually rude and manipulative. Uh, did I miss anything important in class today? No, no, I never say anything important in class. And no, you didn't miss anything important in class. Uh, and last, can you tell me when my grade is going into the final? Generally speaking, you have access to all the information that your grade is determined upon. And if you have to ask me two weeks before the end of class what your grade is, that means you haven't been paying attention to the material I'm handing back or you didn't look at the syllabus for the different requirements. So uh, note, by the way, just to flip the page, there are three uh, midterm, interim classes, each 20, and I explain that in my email and, um, and, uh, and the PRQs. For each midterm test, I'll pick uh, 15 of those questions and give you the choice of 10 to answer within an hour time. And if you have an accommodation, that's fine. We can work that out. And, and at Converse College, the exam period is a three-hour period. Um, if this were an in-person class, I would be using um, uh, a, an assigned day and period. Still might. Well, I'm still working on that one. But if not, one way or the other, you'll have a three-hour period for the exam. And for that, I will pick um, uh, 30 questions, I believe, and, and have you... Uh, uh, 
answer 20 of those, which is why the final counts more. And as I mentioned, if you look, attendance and participation are 10%, which means to me, as I've suggested several times, that you've certified to me that you've actually watched the lecture by email. You don't have to summarize the lectures, just let me know honestly if you have attended. Um, you can read the course description and objectives. Uh, my aim is to uh, make you as knowledgeable and reflective about the origin, nature, and principles of American political life as I can. People ask me all the time, students do, you know, um, what do you think of President Trump? What do you think of President Biden? What do you think of this and this? And I, I don't use my classes to indoctrinate my students. I have a I have a partisan identity. I'm, I'm, I have political passions and opinions just like most Americans. And we live in an unusually passionate and partisan time where uh, people are ready to shoot each other in the head when they find out they don't belong to the right political party. And I think one of the most distressing aspects of contemporary American life is cancel culture. Goodness gracious. Um, uh, it's as if people want to bring the habits uh, that you would bring to grade eighth grade recess when you taunt people uh, to make them humiliate them on during on the playground during recess and make that the principle of American popular culture. I have political passions and opinions and ideas. My job is not to make you think like me or to turn you into a, a political imitation of me. That's not my job. I'm not an indoctrinator. I'm an educator. And it, my job is to, again, to make you thoughtful and informed. And, it, and I'll walk you quickly through how I have structured the, the syllabus. And uh, as I mentioned in an email, I have done it essentially by um, uh, dividing the main sections of the course and, and prefacing them with a set of questions that an educated American college student or, or a college student or a thoughtful person should be able to answer about each of those topics. So that's how I have organized the syllabus. And, uh, and so you can look at the, the as for the course difficulty, um, there isn't that actually that much reading, but I do, but the reading is often difficult for many students because it's primarily uh, uh, primary documents. Uh, there is a text, but it's a well-written text. And, um, and my job, as I said earlier, was to make you capable, is to, is to give you the capacity to read difficult texts with care, attention, and accuracy. Um, let me just walk you through the um, structure of the syllabus. So uh, essentially, each part of the syllabus is, is two sections, and each uh, midterm will cover each of those two sections. So um, uh, in the first two weeks, we'll be looking at the origin of American politics and its core ideas in the Declaration and in the founding period, and as I explained, uh, and that's, by the way, Wilson Chapter 2 is essentially the chapter that covers the whole founding period from the colonial period, very briefly, to the Declaration and to the founding period. And by founding, historians and political scientists mean the period in which our foundational institutions were shaped and put in place. And, of course, it turns out we had two constitutions. We had the original Articles of Confederation, which was a, everyone acknowledges more or less was a failure, and then the Constitution. So... Um, that's what we'll cover in the first two um, uh, uh, sections. And uh, and I have added since this last year, because the issue of race has become so controversial, and, and you hear all kinds of things like white supremacy and systemic racism, and, and therefore the nature and place of slavery and race in the founding is, is a critical topic. I've always addressed that in my American government classes, but it's become an urgent topic of concern and discussion and in particular, the New York Times in 2019 initiated something called the 1619 Project, which made the interesting claim that the true founding of our country was not 1776, but 1619, the first point at which African American slaves were uh, uh, sold and imported into the American continent. So this is a critical topic. It's a, it's a critical topic not only in terms of understanding our nation and its origins, but it is also a key to much of the controversy and and intense passions which divide and animate our country at this time. So I have added a consideration of those issues to that period. After that, um, uh, we will also um, uh, do an intensive review of the Constitution. And, uh, and so that will conclude that period. Um, the third, in, uh, the third section of the course has to do with then the, 
the primary structural feature of our Constitution, aside from the separation of powers and checks and balances on the national level, um, uh, and that is the question of federalism, the division of authority uh, between the states and the national government, which, as I explained in my first lecture, is a yawner for undergraduates, but it turns out that's been the most persistent set of uh, a source of political tensions and divisions in American life. Um, and then the rest of the courts more or less then follows the institutions of national government, both as generated by the Constitution, but also some critical issues and institutions that are not dealt with in the Constitution, such as the party system. So as you'll see, after dealing with the, the declaration in the Constitution, the nature of the constitutional system, first we'll turn to federalism. Uh, and you'll see in each of these sections, uh, I, I cover three main questions. What were the original intentions and purposes of that aspect of our political system? How has that aspect changed historically over time? How are our institutions different from the way they were designed? And what are the typical questions and criticisms that uh, that are made of both of our system in general? Um, I mean, um, I, I, the one partisan opinion, I guess I'll make known in this class, is I am an advocate of the Constitution. Uh, the great English uh, Prime Minister William Gladstone uh, described the American Constitution as, and this was an Englishman, by the way, um, as the single greatest work of the mind of man struck off in a single time and place. I share that opinion. I've been studying the Constitution and the founding all my life in American politics, and this is the one partisan thing I'll say. I happen to think the United States of America is the greatest nation in the history of the world. I'll come back to this in my last comments in this class. What I mean by that is uh, the United States uh, a political system based on the Constitution has generated more uh, freedom, stability, prosperity uh, uh, for the masses of humanity than any other existent political system. That's the closest thing I'll come in this course to uh, announcing my own opinion. But it does animate my understanding of this material. Having said that, I am not a fool um, most of the time. When my medication starts to wear out, then I suppose I'm a fool. Um, and there's no such thing as perfection in human life, uh, contrary to what my mother believes about me. May she, that bless her heart, as we say. Um, and clearly there are tensions and imperfections, and America has its share of sins in the world. But um, uh, I am an advocate of the constitutional system. That I'll say that much. So to get back to the structure of the class, um, so after dealing with the overall nature system and then the question of federalism, then we go through Congress, and if you're turning the page, um, then the Electoral College. And the Electoral College has been discussed a lot in the last several years. Uh, and we'll talk about how the Electoral College was supposed to work, how it works. And uh, the Electoral College got a lot of attention this last fall and early January. And then um, we'll turn to the party system. Now, the party system is not, our political parties are not discussed in the Constitution. They grew up afterwards, but they're a critical component of the system. And you'll see there are criticisms made of it. And then we'll turn to the presidency, policy making, and we'll finish off with the judiciary. So that's essentially how I designed the course. You can look at the grades. I've talked about exams and um, uh, in the PRQs. So uh, as I said, um, uh, on Monday, I'll, uh, I'll make some introductory comments about the nature of politics. I am a political scientist, and in particular, as I said, my core fields are political philosophy. I, 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 I tend to describe myself as both an Aristotelian and a Tocquevillian, from Alexis to Tocqueville and Aristotle, of course. But I'm going to talk about what politics is, as this is an introductory course. What, the, what a political system is, and, and, uh, and certain other aspects of American uh, politics. And then uh, the following Wednesday, then we'll begin again the, the substantive material in the, in the course. So welcome to this course. I love teaching American government, and, um, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Again, I'm always open for consultation and questions. And, um, and, you'll, and let me just say, say one other thing. Don't blow off the emails. I send out a lot of material, and all of your materials will be sent to me. Your tests and everything will be uh, email. I don't use. I only put the material on Canvas so that you have access to things 
just in case you did blow off an email. So as I've said several times, everything that I um, uh, send out to you by email, the questions, the notes, um, everything, um, uh, will be are, are, are on Canvas primarily for your reference. But your exam materials and everything will be sent to me essentially by email. So email is the primary way. So uh, there will be a lot of emails in this class, and you must... Um, uh, be responsible and pay attention to them. So if you get an email from me, I'm not saying if you have one that comes in from the same time as your mother and me that I should have preference over your mother, but um, but don't uh, ignore them because uh, it's the essential medium by which we communicate aside from these uh, pre-recorded lectures. Again, uh, welcome to the course. I hope you enjoy it, and uh, we will see you on Monday.